Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Recently, I was speaking to an individual who leads a congregation in America, and I asked him his thoughts concerning Israel and the Jewish people. And his response, although not surprising, was very unfortunate. Because his view, as so many Christians have, is one that's not rooted prophetically in the Word of God. His statement was that God has no purpose or plan anymore for the land of Israel. And although he says anyone, Jew and Gentile alike, can find salvation in Messiah Yeshua, he said, there is no longer any special connection, any covenantal relationship between the Jewish people and the Lord God Almighty. But when we look at the word of God, we see a very different account. And even though people want to look at this scripture and try to spiritualize it, make it an allegory, see it as symbolic of something else, when we look at it clearly in the simplest way, the straightforward way that it's given to us, there is no other conclusion to make than God is going to work a great salvation for the Jewish people. And of course, their salvation won't be any different than anyone else's salvation. It comes by faith in that only message of redemption. And I'm speaking about the gospel. Well, as you know, we are in the midst of a study, a study from the prophet Isaiah, and we're now ready for chapter four, a short chapter but a very significant one. So look there with me, Isaiah and chapter 4. Now, you'll recall that last week in the second half of chapter 3, we were looking at the spiritual condition of Judah and Jerusalem. And we saw there that there was immort immorality. We saw that there was a spirit of haughtiness, we see that there was not modesty and propriety among the women. And all of that shows us a, of a spiritual decay within the people in general. Not just women, but also men. But we're going to see a change in chapter 4. A change that comes from judgment. Now, one of the points that we can make here is that these individuals that were not living obediently, not walking in truth, but reflecting the ways of the world instead of the ways of God, it wasn't because that they were unaware of what was right and wrong. They knew that they were rebelling against God's word. Now, perhaps they didn't really believe it as the word of God. Perhaps they did, and they just set it aside. And obviously, there would be some that would be unknowing, but, but not the most. Not what we see in this passage of Scripture. So look to verse 1 of chapter 4. Remember the context. End of chapter 3, women walking in a spirit of, of harlotry, wanting to call attention to their physical characteristics, not morality, not spiritualness in the proper sense, but that which is carnal and sensual. But here, notice verse 1. Seven women, they will seize one man. Now, ish achad, 
many times in the scripture, and we've talked about this repeatedly, that the term one can oftentimes refer to God. So here, even though it says one man, ish achad, there is a hint that this one man is a man of God, someone who submits to biblical instruction. And it says here that seven women, remember that number seven, speaks about holiness, sanctification, and the purpose of God. What we see here is an example of repentance, turning away from one's own path, one's own desires, one's philosophy of life, and embracing the purpose of God. So it says here, these seven women, they will seize one man. When? Beyom hahu. That familiar term, on that day. And the context here is judgment day. That God is moving. He is bringing his judgment upon the world. And in light of that, when Israel sees the judgment of God, it is going to produce repentance. Here, the focus is on women. But as I spoke of earlier, the women simply represent the spiritual condition of both men and women, society in general. So these seven women, they will grab onto one man on that day, saying, and notice what they say, our bread we will eat, and our own clothes we will wear. Only let your name be called upon us. Now, what this pictures with this name of one man being called upon a woman, it speaks of a marital covenant. We see that there's a change, that women are going to embrace the purpose of God by means of a covenantal relationship. And what is God saying here through the prophet Isaiah? God is saying that there's coming a day when Israel will have a change in her spiritual condition, that they will turn away from how they were living in rebelliousness to covenantal truth, and they will embrace the man of God. Now, it's interesting who many of the commentators, and this doesn't make it right, but it's worth listening to how sages of old have interpreted this. So they will grab onto one man, Ish Achad, perhaps a reference to a man of God. And they won't want anything of themselves, meaning, they're not doing it for a personal reason. They said, our own food we will eat and our own clothes we will wear. They do not want it for a, a financial purpose, a fleshly, a carnal, a, a physical reason. But it want, they want it in order to, notice what it says, a sof cherpatenu, a sof to gather up our shame or the contempt that we have. So they want a spiritual change. They want a different reputation, a different testimony. Now, who is this ish achad, this one man? Well, notice where the scripture goes now. Look at verse 2. What's the first word? And oftentimes when you're studying in a, a translated language, whether it be English, as most of you speak, or some other language, unfortunately, frequently, they change the word order. They do not translate things the same way because they do not want a, a boring repetition, they think. So they use synonyms and such. This ought not be done. Because when I look at verse 2, I see the same phrase, Beyom hahu. What's the purpose of that? Well, first of all, it ties me back to verse 1. 
It lets me know that there's an inherent connection between what was said in verse 1 and what's said in verse 2. Now, I'm looking at a Bible in Hebrew that was produced by believers in Israel. And what I see here is that after verse 1, there's a space, and they put a statement, the, the editors put a statement of description concerning the rest of chapter 4. And it's as though they want to separate chapter 4, verse 1, from the rest of the chapter. This ought not be done. This shows that the editors really didn't understand what Isaiah was teaching. That this is a continuation, the thought, the message continues on into verse 2. And we have that hermeneutical aid when we look at, at verse 2 when it says, Be'yom ha'hu, on that day there will be the branch of the Lord. Tzemach Hashem. Now, if you are a good student of prophecy, you'll recall. This is true, for example, in the book of Jeremiah, also in the book of Zechariah, Zechariah, they both use that term tzemach in regard to Messiah. In fact, I don't know of any, any interpreter of Scripture, whether they come from the position of Judaism or from the position of Christianity, whether they be liberal or very conservative, when we see this phrase, Tzemach Hashem, everyone sees this as referring to Messiah. So now we're dealing with something that we can say is related to Yamot HaMashiach, the days of Messiah. And that term in Hebrew, Yamot HaMashiach, days of Messiah, instead of Yamim HaMashiach, there's a change. We won't go into why that is. But the point is this. They see this as having kingdom implications, that we're getting a description, a verbal description, a prophetic revealing of the kingdom of God. So on that day, judgment day, the branch of the Lord, in other words, the Messiah, will be for, and the word here, Svi. Svi is used other places prophetically for, a glorious thing. Oftentimes it's used, for example, in Daniel chapter 8, for the glorious land of Israel. In fact, most places, that's how Tzvi is used. The glory of the land or the beauty or the splendor of the land of Israel. But now that word is being used in relationship to Messiah. And what should we do? Well, once more. If you use proper hermeneutical methodology, when you see that this word is usually, Tzvi, is tied to the land of Israel, and now it's tied to Messiah, what is the proper conclusion to draw from that? Well, it shows a connection, a close relationship between Messiah and the land of Israel. What we can infer from that is the character of Messiah, his beauty, his glory is going to transform the land of Israel to the extent that the land of Israel will manifest his character, his, his beauty, his glory. So notice what it says here. On that day, there will be the branch of the Lord for beauty and for glory. Tzvi u le kavod. Kavod means glory, but it's of, of a significance. Something that has a, a weight to it, a significance behind it. And it says, and the fruit of the lamb will be for majesty and splendor. So notice how in verse 2, we see Messiah will be that, that Semach Hashem, that branch of, of the Lord. Now, normally, we talk about Semach David, the branch of David, referring to the son of David, a messianic term. But here, 
we see Samach referring to Messiah, but how it does exactly what I said, how it impacts the fruit of the land and the majesty and its splendor. And all of this will be for who? Notice that last part of verse 2. And that's why it's so frustrating to talk to individuals that have a preconceived theological position. And I'm beginning, I used to not think this, but I'm beginning more and more to see a theological-based anti-Semitism. Because when you show them these things and you say, let's look at the text from the laws of interpreting the scripture as I'm sharing with you this evening. And one or two things usually happen. One, they don't want to look at that. Number two, if they do, we never complete it because this is what they normally say. You're taking the scripture way too literal. You're, you're using these techniques. I've never learned them in, in Bible school. I haven't learned them in seminary. Well, the problem is what used to be a norm is being thrown out. And therefore, they either haven't actually learned them, weren't taught them, or simply weren't at a school that, that did a good job training them in proper means of interpreting the scripture. I mean, these methodologies aren't controversial. There's books, many books written on them. If you look at book for exegesis or hermeneutics, you'll find that, that the older ones all speak of this. And notice what it says here. It's verse two. The subject is Messiah. And his beauty and glory that is going to change the land and make the land a land of, of splendor, a land of maj majesty. And it's going to be for who? Notice what it says here. Pleitat Play, Yisrael. Now, this would be the, the ones who escape. In modern Hebrew, we know this word very good because it's a word for refugee. So it's speaking here about those who are the refugees of Israel, those who escape. Now, what comes into my mind is what we read in the book of Yoel, Joel. Joel, end of chapter 2 in the English, chapter 3 in the Hebrew. Same words, just a different ordering of the chapter and verses, but same content, not any different. And what we find here is that in chapter 2, it speaks about the day of the Lord. What's that? Judgment. But it also speaks about those who call upon the name of the Lord. They will be saved, and they will escape. Who will escape? We find this, this same term, the refugees of Israel. Now, the refugees, and notice that they're tied to the land of Israel. Now, I realize that there are those who want to say the land is symbolic to the kingdom. And the refugees of Israel speaks to the church. But there's a problem with that. Notice what it says. Move now to verse 3. And it shall come about those that remain in Zion and those who are left over in Jerusalem. Now, we're speaking here, not symbolically, we're speaking about the land terms that throughout the scripture are spoken of in regard to the land, the capital, the holy city of, of Jerusalem. And the term Zion has kingdom implications. These are speaking about the survivors or the refugees. Three different words. You have the word pleitat Yisrael, and then we have the word here in verse 3, ha nishar. Nishar is those who are left, and also the word notar, for the remaining ones. So all of these are specific terms, those who remain. Now, these individuals, more or less, these are the ones, and I would agree with them. That before the wrath of God falls, there's going to be that blessed hope, the rapture. So the church isn't going to be around 
for this judgment of God for what we're speaking about now. They may return, and I believe this based upon 1 Thessalonians 3.13. Believers are going to return with Messiah when he comes the second time. But notice, these are the ones that are left over there, who come to faith at the end. Who's that? Well, Paul teaches, the prophets teach, Messiah teaches in Matthew 24 that there's going to be a remnant of the elect that is going to embrace the gospel in the last days. That's what we're talking about. Look at all of verse 3. And it shall come about the ones who remain in Zion, those who are, are left over in Jerusalem. It says, holy, he will be called, or it will be called to him, holy. Now, this is interesting because this is something that's happening when? At the last days. Well, take me, for example. From the moment that I or any other believer, the moment that you believe, you become a kadosh. You become holy. And believers are called kadoshim, the saints. So what we find here. It makes no sense that this is in the future, saying they will, it will be called to him holy. This speaks about Samach, the Messiah returning. And by the way, the term Samach, when it's used in regard to Messiah, has to do with Messiah's work in the last days to deliver Israel in faithfulness to the Davidic covenant. Very significant what we see the terms being used here. So we read that, that all the ones who are written for life, who are inscribed for life, and how do they get inscribed for life? One way. We see this in the book of, of Revelation, by faith in the Lamb, that Lamb, Yeshua HaMashiach, Messiah, Jesus Christ. And their names are inscribed because they were redeemed with that blood of the Lamb. Blood of the Lamb, what comes into your mind? Passover. Passover redemption. So they are inscribed, and the implication is then that book of life. Where? In Jerusalem. And Zion and Jerusalem speak about a kingdom reality. That they are inscribed for that kingdom, those who survive. Survive what? Bayom Hahu, judgment day. How are they going to survive it? Because Messiah is going to return. There's going to be his revelation, his manifestation. And Israel is going to look upon the one whom they have pierced. And they're going to receive him. The spirit of grace is going to fall upon them. That's what the prophets say. Now, the problem is this. If you want to interpret this symbolically, allegorically, if you want to spiritualize it, it makes no sense. When Messiah returns, who's going to be looking upon him? Not, not the church. They're going to be coming with him. So we need to be clear that there has to be a consistency. And that's why when I, I share with people, oftentimes uh, different leaders doing a, a conference in one city or another, whether it be in America or, or in Europe or in Asia or in Australia, we talk about these things. And it's amazing to me that people have strong beliefs. And when you say, well, can you share that with me biblically? I remember so well, I was in our, our home in Israel and sitting next to a young man who wanted to come to Israel to serve. And we began to talk about theology and the things relating to the last days and specifically Israel. And he says, uh, I believe this, this, and this. Fine. Why? Can you show me in the scripture, if you're going to be teaching and, and we're going to be working together, if you have these beliefs, which I am strongly opposed to, I'll share with you why I'm opposed to them biblically. What scriptures to me that says I can't receive that? I don't believe in that because of this. But why don't you share with me first what in the Bible 
leads you to those conclusions. And he said, well, I, I, I don't know any scripture off the top of my head, but people I respect, people I look up to, people I've sat under, they believe these things and they teach these things. And so I said, well, didn't you write down why, what the scriptural references were for them? And he was very honest, and I appreciate that. He said, well, I think it was more of a lecture rather than a, a teaching. It was a sharing of theological beliefs rather than how they arrived at those beliefs. And that's always the case, always the case. What I find from replacement theologians is a hesitancy to dig into the prophets, to look at with a precision what Paul says and what we should expect. And when you go and look at the book of Revelation, they'll say, oh, that's all been fulfilled except for maybe the last two chapters. All of that's in the past. Well, this is a problem. They don't like prophecy because it interferes with their beliefs. Look now to verse, verse 4. What is God going to do? Verse 4. Now, the word here is im. Im is if. And what it's speaking, I realize many of your Bibles will say when. But it's im, and there's a reason for this. This word means if. And it sees, it foreshadows a specific outcome. It talks about what will be the results because God does it. So if God does it, and he will, it's a promise. So I understand when, but the emphasis is because God does this, this will be the outcome. If the Lord, he washes the filth of the daughters of Zion. Now, that word filth, it is a very strong word. I would do research on it, and I would tell you that it speaks of that which is, is very uh, dirty or waste, human waste, that which soils. So it says, if the Lord washes the filth of the daughters of Zion and the blood, and this would be the blood guiltiness is the intent, the blood guiltiness from Jerusalem, it he cleanses. I like this because this is the word yediach. Yediach is a word for wash. We have it in not the future, but in the present tense. Mediach kelim is a dishwasher in modern Hebrew. So it's a, a washing thoroughly from her midst. So if God does this, there's going to be an outcome. And we should anticipate God doing that because he's promised to do so. And how is he going to do that? He says here, Beruach Mishpat, with the spirit of judgment. Now, this is so important because the word Mishpat, judgment, is key. Now, the word spirit, it can have a, a connotation of order. So it's the spirit of judgment that is going to produce order. And it's going to, notice what else it says, and in the spirit of, the word here is the word ba'er. Ba'er speaks about burning. In uh, less than a month, we're going to be celebrating Pesach, Passover. And there's the time that we burn the chametz. We get rid of all the leaven. We burn up what remains before Passover. And that's that same word, beer, or here in this case, it's the word ba'er. So it's the spirit burning away, destroying all those things that are unclean. And all of this is going to bring about what I would call a new creation. And what's the reason that I call it a new creation? Twofold. Many places in the scripture, it speaks about the establishment of the kingdom of God as a creation a second creation, a new creation. And look at verse 5. Uvarah Hashem. And the Lord, he will create over all the habitation. Now, this is a word, machon. And machon is a, a place that has been established. So it's a word for a habitation, but it has 
a, a degree of, of strength or power to it having been established this, this place, this dwelling place. Where? Hartzion. Referring to the kingdom reality. But where is that? In the Israel of today. And upon her, her assembly. Now, the word here for assembly is mikra. It's an important word because this word has to do with calling. And it's also, if you look at the scripture in the book of Leviticus, when it speaks about a holy convocation, an old uh, English word to convocate, meaning together, together. But in Hebrew, it comes from the word to call. A convocation the word can mean assembly so it speaks here about those who are going to be assembled based upon what based upon God's proclamation what he has proclaimed proclaimed prophetically so we see here in this term a, a an image a reference to the faithfulness of God to his prophetic promises this is what he's saying here so the lord is going to create over every habitation of mount zion and over the assembly her assembly her referring to jerusalem her assembly and what is that a cloud by day and smoke now this is reminiscent of of the exodus from egypt that God uh, sheltered the people with, with a cloud by day. But it also could be a reference to what God was going to do. Where? Well, this uh, coming weekend, now it's probably last weekend when this is going to be released. But we, in our weekly live stream called Midnight from Jerusalem, we're going to be studying the second part of Exodus 20. And there we have that great event, an event where we see that Mount Sinai was, was ablaze with fire and smoke and lightning and voices of the shofar, all sorts of things. And I mentioned that that same thing occurs two or three times in the book of Revelation, meaning John took that, that image of Har Sinai, the mountain of Sinai, and the giving of the, the commandments. And we see that God wanted to bring a change to Israel. Now, the purpose of this uh, uh, talk now in our study in Isaiah 4 is to not go into Exodus 20, but I would encourage you to study that video. Just look for Exodus 20, part 2 in our, our YouTube channel or various internet platforms. You go to the book of Exodus, for example, in our app called My Bible Study, and you'll see that a great event God wanted to bring about for his people, a change. It's used, that same imagery is used in the book of Revelation when God, in in fact, will bring a change to his people. And it's referenced here. Why? Notice again. He's going to bring it, a prophetic promise to those who assemble based upon God's instruction. He's going to bring upon them a cloud by day and smoke. And notice what it says. Ve noga esh. Noga is a bright, bright, bright light. And this is a bright light of fire and a flame by night. And all of this is imagery that depicts what took place at Mount Sinai and the change that God was going to bring. And he says, for upon all is going to be the glory as a chupa. Now, many Bibles don't translate the word chupa correctly. Chupa is a marriage canopy. And the choice here speaks about a marriage the glory of God is going to be over them through a covenant that's being established. Now, notice the correlation. Remember what we learned back in chapter 1, or excuse me, verse 1, chapter 4, our chapter, but in verse 4, about these seven women 
who want to enter into a covenant marriage with the man of God. Who's that man of God? Well, in chapter 2 or verse 2, it's Messiah. And now we see a marriage taking place between Messiah and the children of Israel. At a hupa, the marriage canopy, every Jewish marriage by Jewish law takes place under a hupa, a canopy. And we see here, verse 6, there's another unique word, sukkah. Many of you know the word sukkah as in the festival of Sukkot or the Feast of Tabernacles. And sukkah, this word for tabernacle, speaks about making one dependent upon God, trusting him. And this is how they're going to receive this benefit. So it says, there will be a sukkah, a tabernacle, shall be for a, a shelter or a shadow by day from heat. The word is chorev. Now, what's interesting is chorev means can mean heat or dryness, as probably your Bible will translate. But it's also, excuse me, also another word for Mount Sinai, Mount Horeb. So we see that it will be a shade, this, this canopy, this sukkah, this tabernacle will be for, for a shade by day from dryness and heat. <coughs> and from a, a shelter and a, some Bibles may say refuge, but it's a word for a hiding place, to be hid. So it's going to be for a tabernacle, a shelter, a hiding place from what? From the storm and the rain. And here we're talking about the reigning of God's judgment. The only way that we can escape the storm that's coming of God's judgment is by taking refuge, by entering into his hiding place, by going under his marriage canopy and entering into an eternal relationship with the man of God, Messiah Yeshua, who is the son of God, who is God among us. This chapter four, such a beautiful chapter in referring to us the faithfulness of God how God acts in accordance with his prophetic truth, the change that he's going to bring upon Israel. And I'm so grateful for that because as God keeps covenant with Israel and brings them into faith, this remnant in the last days, I can be assured that his new covenant promises he's going to keep, maintain, and the promises of that covenant with Israel that are glorious, well, those promises of a new covenant are even greater because they're made with the very blood of the Son of God. Great, great message from Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 4. Well, I'll stop there until we move into another great passage next week when we begin Isaiah chapter 5. Until then, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.